dreams have the power to drive us forward in life's mortal race against time. Speed is our weapon in the battle with this eternal foe. But in racing, speed burns money. And as 1977 began, I was 22 years old and broke, so I needed a new racing plan. I sold my Eldon Formula Ford to fund the next uncertain step in my racing journey during an uncertain time. In December 1976, the SCCA Formula 5000 series died with barely a whimper. I was there for the last race at Riverside two months earlier. Al Unser won as Brian Redmond captured his third and final Formula 5000 championship. Then the SCCA Can-Am series rose from the ashes and I was soon busy illustrating Can-Am body conversion kits for clients. But I wasn't really into it because they were fake, and I was an expert on fake. But I was also now obsessed with the very real world of Formula One, where James Hunt, Nicky Lauda, Mario Andretti, and Jody Schechter would battle for racing's ultimate prize. Jody rose to prominence in British Formula Ford, He'd opened the Formula One season with a surprising underdog victory in Argentina that fueled my desire to race. I'd also art directed the 1977 Motorcycle Racing Annual for Paul Oxman Publishing, and I was inspired by dominant American racer Kenny Roberts. Britain's weekly autosport magazine was my racing bible, where I followed the upward progress of rising stars like 1976 Formula Ford Festival winner Derek Daly. My illustration business was expanding, and I designed the body kit and graphics for a Ford Fiesta built by Automotive Development that appeared on the cover of Hot Rod magazine. While my younger sister Diane now worked part-time for my friend Mike Hall, who was now Automotive Development's general manager, while he also raced their highly developed ADF Mark II Formula Ford in SECA events. Then my hero, Dan Gurney, surprised me by building an Eagle Formula Ford. He hired veteran American racer David Loring to build the cars, while also preparing and racing the factory entry in SCCA Nationals. But the truth is, I was lost and on the outside looking in, without a race car or a viable plan to get back in the cockpit. Being deeply delusional like most Formula Ford racers, I still dreamed of racing in Formula One, but that dream was about to become a nightmare. From the 7th to the 78 laps, the Ferrari gets in front, and that is the last we see of it. The race is marked by a terrible accident. Renzo Zorzi's shadow is at a standstill on the track, its engine smoking. Two officials rush towards it, crossing the track from the other side, and tragedy strikes. The second official is struck by the second shadow, which is accelerating hard, driven by the Welshman, Tom Price. Well, the official is killed instantly, as is Price, whose helmet is almost ripped off by the official's fire extinguisher. Lauda won the race, despite everything, and described it as one of his greatest victories. Tom Price was just 27 years old. 13 days later, Brazilian Formula One racer Carlos Pache died in a plane crash at the age of 32. But all this tragedy made me profoundly aware of my own mortality, so my desire to race anything became even stronger. I jumped at the chance to race at a media karting event at the Queen Mary prior to the third annual Long Beach Grand Prix. But my ego was crushed by the rapid pace and racecraft of my friend and new Formula Magazine editor, Pete Lyons, who beat me. But what came next provided the ultimate inspiration and motivation. My hero, Mario Andretti, was proving that he was a serious contender for the F1 World Championship in Colin Chapman's revolutionary Lotus 78 Ford that pioneered modern ground effect aerodynamics. The 1977 Long Beach Grand Prix became a tense battle between Schechter, Andretti, and Lauda that lasted 77 laps until a deflating tire on Jody's Wolf Ford allowed Mario and Nicky to pass just three laps from the end of the race. Now the championship momentum had shifted to Mario, and the beautiful Lotus 78 was the car to beat. As expected, the race was marked by Mario Andretti's domination. Out on his own throughout, Lafitte and Reutemann tried to keep up, but can't rival him. Mario was also proving that Americans belonged in Formula One. He was inspiring young racers like me to reach for the stars. 
just as America and the world was discovering the story of good versus evil in a battlefield amid the stars, conceived by the brilliant mind of eraser and filmmaker George Lucas. Star Wars was a revolution in filmmaking, but another more important revolution was taking place in Indianapolis. As Janet Guthrie became the first woman to qualify for the Indy 500, but there was more history to be made. Now they're in the race cars. Soon we'll hear Tony Holman with his annual announcement, but we think it's going to be different. Remember, there is a woman in the race this time. And the age-old cry, of course, is, gentlemen, start your engines. Tony would not tell us this morning exactly what he's going to say. Let's go now to track owner Tony Holman. In company with the first lady ever to qualify at Indianapolis, Gentlemen, start your red gun. And so they are started. And a woman was at the rear of Janet Guthrie's car there, Kay Pignotti, the wife of the team leader of another team, George Pignotti. There is Janet, the handshake for the first woman driver ever in the race. And the engines are started on the main stretch at Indianapolis. Crew members holding their hands in the air to indicate that everyone is in good shape. Three hours and six minutes later. A.J. Foyt of the gleaming Gilmore 14 Coyote, the Gilmore Racing Team, home, and he wins again. Foyt is here and with us, but it will be some time before all of the congratulations have been pushed truly out of the way. People attempting to make their way into the car itself. A.J. Foyt in victory lane four times. Never before has it been done, and in the minds of all here, the question must be, can it ever be done by anyone again? A.J. Foyt became an American legend. This was the high point for the Indy 500 and for IndyCar racing, but storm clouds were gathering beyond the horizon. With June came the unlikely rebirth of the once mighty SCCA Can-Am series. Formula cars became sports racers with hastily conceived body kits. And shockingly, SCCA Formula 5000 champion Brian Redman was seriously injured when his Lola T333 did a backflip in practice. That first race was won by a Lola T332 conversion called a Schke BB1, driven by Formula Atlantic ace Tom Clauser. This was the only car that impressed me because of its innovative body design. A week later, I became aware that the SCCA Sports Car Magazine contract was up for bid, and I convinced publisher Paul Oxman to submit a proposal that I would help prepare. We soon headed north to Laguna Seca for the second round of the Can-Am series, where we met with SCCA President Tom Duvall to discuss the contract during a red flag practice session while safety workers extracted George Fulmer following a shocking accident that we witnessed during the meeting. Danger is my middle name, so a week later I was ready for the next step in my racing journey. Although I was still afraid of disco, I was not afraid of stepping into an unfamiliar racing car. With the help and advice of Automotive Development's Paul White and Mike Hall, I rented their pristine 1973 Titan Mark VI Formula Ford to enter my fourth SCCA race at Riverside during the July 4th weekend. I qualified fifth out of 45 cars, and by the third lap I was in third, and then I made a desperate lunge for the lead under braking. I clipped the leader and damaged both of our cars, but we all now knew I could get to the front, which made my desire to race sore. As I celebrated my 23rd birthday in early August, I was thinking of my dad and the final thing he worked on that would also soon soar. Go, Rockwell. Go. Roger. Roger, we're going for takeoff. Above all else, Dad inspired me to realize that all I really have is now, and it was up to me to use now to live my dreams. Dad also taught me to forgive my own mistakes and to focus on achieving my dreams, just as he had done in his all-too-brief life. But then, another inspiring life ended far too soon. Good evening. Elvis Presley died today. He was 42. Apparently, it was a heart attack. On that same day, Formula One raced where the very first world championship round was held in 1950. Since dawn, a record crowd of enthusiasts who've been patiently waiting through the night have poured through the gates into Silverstone. Gunnar Nilsson, winner of the Belgian Grand Prix, with Team Lotus boss man, the brilliant Colin Chapman. 
and the redoubtable Mario Andretti. JPS team leader, winner of three 1977 Grand Prix and a hot prospect today. But it's James Hunt who the crowd will be willing on. Back on form again after three days of practice, he's in pole position with a lap at nearly 135 miles an hour. Jody Schechter's won twice this year in the new Wolf Ford. Gilles Villeneuve, sensational in practice for his first Formula One race. Carlos Reutemann, winner at Brazil, Ferrari's number two driver. Their number one is Nicky Lauda. Nicky, how important is discipline to the running of your team? Especially to us it's very important because it sometimes seems that we have a little bit too much panic around. After a dismal season, James Hunt reminded everyone why he was the reigning F1 world champion. While Gilles Villeneuve, whom Hunt had recommended to Team McLaren, delivered a sensational performance on his Formula One debut. Villeneuve's success was a beacon of hope for racers in North America, like my talented friend Bobby Rahal, who was reaching for the stars in his uncharted voyage to Formula One. During the first weekend of September, a different voyage began when the first of two tiny spacecraft named Voyager was launched. 45 years later, Voyager 1 is now 4 billion miles from Earth and deep into interstellar space on an ongoing mission for all mankind. Nikki Lauda and Mario Andretti were on different missions at Monza. The big news of the Italian Grand Prix was heard in the corridors. Although the news was not official, Lauda had told Enzo Ferrari on the evening of his Dutch victory that he would no longer be driving for him in 1978. Well, the Austrian's transfer to Brabham had already been negotiated. It doesn't take much to imagine the dreadful internal atmosphere in which Lauda had to compete in the most important race of the season for his employer. Schechter led for the first nine laps before Mario Andretti took over control. The same Mario Andretti had had an offer from Enzo Ferrari to drive the legendary red cars in 1978. An offer that he did not take up, preferring to remain loyal to Colin Chapman. Andretti had the joy of winning the two Grand Prix that he really held dear in 1977. America and Italy. The man from Trieste had come full circle. Meanwhile, I was on my own mission to get back into the cockpit, despite my tiny racing budget. So naturally, I found myself at a taco restaurant in Mexico City to retrieve my next ride that was stored outside behind the kitchen. It was a 1971 Titan Mark 6A Formula Ford that I'd rented for $500 with the help of my friend Mike Hall, who'd recently been working with several racers in Mexico. With the assistance of Fernando Torres of the Mexican Formula Ford Association, we took the car to the famed Autodromo Hermanos Rodriguez Formula One circuit it for a test session. Just before I pulled onto the track, it began to rain. Hard. I was only able to drive three very scary laps at speed, but that was enough to convince me to commit to race in the season finale in early November. But I wasn't the only racer making new commitments and changing direction. Only three races remained and Lauda only lacked one point to be officially crowned champion. Another internal drama had shaken Ferrari. When they learned that Lauda's successor was to be Gilles Villeneuve, Lauda persuaded his chief mechanic, Hermano Cuoggi, to go with him to Brabham the following season. When Ferrari discovered that, he decided to sack the traitor in the middle of the warm-ups. Everything was changing fast in Formula One and in racing overall since the year before, except for Mario Andretti's desire and the courage and intelligence of Nicky Lauda. James Hunt took control. The English driver held on until the end to pocket his second victory of the season. He was in front of Andretti and Schechter. Place fourth, Lauda pocketed three points, which definitively crowned him champion. Without his accidents at the Nürburgring in 1976, he could have won three consecutive titles. I was struck by how quickly the momentum had faded for James Hunt in 1977. He would never win a Formula One race again. And Nicky Lauda would never race a Ferrari again. At the Canadian Grand Prix, a week later, Gilles Villeneuve, who James Hunt had discovered the year before in Formula Atlantic, would replace the newly crowned world champion, who decided not to finish the season after clinching the title at Watkins Glen. It was a forgettable race for Gilles, with a spin and a DNF, leaving him in 12th place. 
while Hunt's frustrating season hit a low point when he crashed and then punched a marshal. Mario Andretti experienced yet another mechanical failure while leading, handing Jody Schechter his third victory of the year, while fellow American racer Danny Ngaias finished seventh in only his second Formula One start. Danny remains the first and still only racer to make the unlikely journey from drag racing to Formula One. With October came the news that Paul Oxman Publishing had been awarded the contract to publish Sports Car Magazine for the SCCA. And I was now back in the magazine game as art director and managing editor. I attended the SCCA Can-Am season finale at Riverside with a new energy and optimism. And I also got to see the interesting Ski Can-Am car again. But I had little inkling of the role it would soon play in shaping my future. I also moved out of our family's home and into an apartment with my new roommate, Steve Nicholas, who'd come to California from Massachusetts to edit Sports Car Magazine. Steve would begin our Sports Car Magazine journey with a visit to the 1977 SCCA runoffs. Road Atlanta is a racetrack set in the red clay and pine-covered hills of northern Georgia. Its name is synonymous with a very special event in the world of racing, the Sports Car Club of America's annual championship runoffs. Steve shared my love of SCCA Formula Ford, and we also followed international rising stars like American Willie T. Ribs and Brit Nigel Mansell, who were racing in the UK. In the first week of November, I went international and flew to Mexico City again to race at the site of the last Mexican Grand Prix in 1970, where crowds had jumped fences to sit at the edge of the track for a better view of the action. I stayed with my friend Fernando Torres, and I traveled with my photographer friend Paul Webb, who shot these images. And the Titan Formula Ford I'd rented would be prepared by Craig Shirey, who was an excellent mechanic. But I was all dressed up with nowhere to go when the neglected car developed a series of mechanical problems. So when the single car qualifying began on Saturday, I had zero laps of practice. As I was preparing to qualify, Fernando informed me that the PA announcer had introduced me as Raul Piffiner, Grand Piloto y Campeón de California, which was a slight exaggeration. I flew down the very long front straight into turn one on my qualifying lap, where I promptly spun and lightly tapped the guardrail. This clever move allowed me to watch every other driver successfully navigate the same corner during their qualifying laps. It was a very long walk back to the pits, but the car was easily repaired. I would start last, and I also had a leaking rear tire that was discovered on the grid, so things could only go up from there. Surprisingly, I moved forward from 22nd to 10th. As I learned the very fast racetrack by drafting through the field on the tail of talented Mexican racer David Roca, who finished ninth, I was now Raul Piffiner, international racer, and ready for whatever came next. And what came next would foster relationships that would change my life forever.